kwa jina la baba ni la mwana li na roho mtafatiku. Uh, ni la wasalimu katika jina la Yesu. Um, jina langu ni mchinkaji doktori Michael. Uh, ni na toka Amerika kuhusu uh, wa umpando mungu uh, kwa wote wote. That's the way I would begin my presentation when I was in uh, Tanzania a couple weeks ago. All I said there was, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I greet you in the name of Jesus. My name is Pastor Michael, uh, and I have come to share with you God's love in Jesus for all people. Sometimes language can be a barrier for us. And that's about all the Swahili that I know, except for a few words like maji, which means water, or cho, which means toilet. Oh, and then I also learned how to say uh, moja kilimanjaro bariri asante, which means uh, one kilimanjaro beer, thank you. Uh, <laughs> learned that one. <laughs> so, um, but that's about all the Swahili I know. Fortunately, we had Pastor Johanna and Zelu with us who uh, preached for us last Pentecost, if you remember, that he came over, was here in the United States and preached for us. He was with us again. He knows English very well, so he could translate uh, our English into Swahili. But again, language can be a, a barrier for us in sharing the love, God's love in Jesus Christ with other people. But the God who in Genesis confused the languages because of the arrogance of humanity, now here at this first Pentecost, we see him re starting to reverse that curse by allowing the apostles to speak in languages, to share the good news of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. Ever since that first Pentecost day, the Christian church has been in the business of translation. The church has had as its mission-driven imperative the speaking, the telling of the good news, going to people and sharing them with them rather than insisting that they come to us. And that's what your Tanzania mission team had the privilege of doing for 10 days about uh, two weeks ago now. To do this, however, I, I, what I want to do, though, is uh, to highlight how the day of Pentecost really sets Christianity apart from other religions. And to do this, I want to start by asking you a riddle. What has 28 moving parts and 20 tongues. The answer? The European Union. The European Union started out with 15 members that signed the Treaty of Maastricht, and since that time, they added 13 more nations, bringing it up to 28, the number in there. Although now it seems like the Brits want to exit the European Union. They're, they're tired of uh, some foreign elitists uh, dictating their policies and their econ economy there in Britain. But one of the problems that the EU faces is its, that it, it's highly ineffective. And it, the reason for that is because of this language barrier. Twenty languages are spoken among the 28 nations. And any member nation can insist that every agreement be translated into its own language. So at any given time within a European Union session, there are 57 trilingual translators that are on hand. But where do you find a Swedish to Maltese translator or a Hungarian to Portuguese translator? Last year, the European Union spent $1.6 billion in translation services. $1.6 billion in administrative costs that produced absolutely nothing. Now, Let's look at Acts chapter 2, our text. When you consider all the language groups and 
the communication hurdles that were present in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost 2,000 years ago, it's a wonder that any of the message of Jesus got through enough that 3,000 people believed and were baptized into Jesus on the spot. I mean, the reading of this from Acts almost sounds like it's a... Uh-oh. Must have a dead battery. <laughs> Can you advance it one? Oh, there we go. The reading from Acts sounds like it could be the, a roll call from a plenary session of the EU there. You know, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, regions of uh, Cy Libya where Cyrene was in control. Um, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And they were, and there were no trilingual translators there uh, at this session. None except the Holy Spirit. The wonder of it all just rumbled through the crowd. I mean, you heard them say it, you know, are all these not Galileans? How are we hearing them speak in our native tongues? So the first public miracle that happened on that day of Pentecost was one of instant translation. But as you know, translation sometimes isn't sufficient. And our text alerts this to that. All were amazed and perplexed and asked, what does this mean? See, there were Lutherans there that first Pentecost, because who else asks, what does this mean? So two things were needed on that first Pentecost. Not only translation happened, but we also needed the Holy Spirit to do his interpretation, providing understanding for the people. The crowd was witnessing a divine miracle. The words were being spoken in languages and dialects that the disciples had never learned before. But the pilgrims to Jerusalem were hearing the good news of Jesus spoken in their native tongues. But as I said, hearing the word does not always lead to understanding. The second miracle here was that the Holy Spirit was at work in the hearts of these people so that they understood what the disciples were saying, that that gift of faith could be worked into their hearts so that they would believe interpretation was happening. But do you realize how translation makes Christianity unique? Why is it that if you convert to Islam, you have to learn Arabic. Why is it that the Hindu religion suggests that you learn Sanskrit? Why is it that Buddhists, Buddhists say that you need to learn Chinese? Why do converts to Judaism learn Hebrew? Because all these religions insinuate that their God only speaks one language. Do you know it's against the Quran to translate it into any other language, even though it's been done? The death penalty awaits anyone who translates the Quran into a different language. I guess Allah cannot understand anybody else if they don't speak Arabic. So if you want to pray to Allah and you want to hear what Allah says, you have to learn Arabic. But how different the Christian church. From the beginning, from Pentecost, the story of the good news of Jesus Christ has been translated into as many languages as possible. That's because we realize that the power is in the spoken word, not in the particular language. Our God, who created all the languages of the world there, um, hears and understands all of them. And the Holy Spirit can work through those words, whether I say God loves you in English, 
Mungu Nipendo in Swahili, Gott liebe dich in German, or Agapon Theos in Greek, or Amat Deus Tu in Latin. God knows and hears all of these, and the Holy Spirit works the miracle of understanding through all those languages. It doesn't make any difference what language you speak. The spoken and written word has from day one in the Christian church driven our mission imperative. But didn't God tell us that through St. Paul in Romans chapter 10? How, then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The Tanzanian mission team was witnessing a Pentecost happening as we shared God's word with the villagers of western Tanzania. Gary James, Cambry Shrog, Sandra Childs, and Diane, my wife, uh, well, they'll have their chance to talk about their experiences at a later time, but how can I preach on the day of Pentecost without sharing what God did in this mission trip? On this particular mission trip, we were all divided up into six different teams. It, usually there were two Americans on a team, uh, except for me. They always kept me by myself. I guess I don't play well with others or something. Um, but I was always by myself. We had uh, a, a regional pastor who knows English and Swahili. We had a local evangelist who knows Swahili and the skuma, the local language there. And then we had a villager who served as our guide to lead us from house compound, housing compound to housing compound. And these are just scattered, as you can see, all across the landscape. So we had to walk from compound to compound. So there was a lot of walking that was involved. Now, when we would reach one of these uh, nyumbas, which are the housing compounds there, Usually the regional pastor would walk into the area there and go, Odi, 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 which was the skuma way of saying, Hello, is there anybody home? And there we would gather any of the adults and children that were uh, around the housing compound there. A lot of the adults were out in the fields uh, working their uh, crops at that time. But once we got them all around, gathered around us then, the pastor would, exclaim, would explain that we had come from America to share with them God's love in Jesus. Now, the Sakuma people are ancestor-worshiping people. They believe that their dead ancestors still live with them in spirit. And so they're willing to sacrifice their animals and pay for witch doctors to produce charms to make sure that these ancestral spirits don't cause them harm or trouble. They believe in spells and family curses. They believe that there is a God out there who created everything, but that this God is way out there and doesn't deal with them in any way unless they bribe this God to do something for them. They are subject, as St. Paul would say, to the spirits of this world, and indeed they are. Uh, without the presence of God with them, uh, they are subject to the spirits of the world and possession by an evil spirit is quite common there. But once we had gathered them all around, then the pastor or the evangelist would turn to us Americans and say, tell the story. And this is the story that we told. We would start out where we had things in common. They believe in a God who created the heavens and the earth. So do we. And they believe that God created everything perfectly. So do we. But they know that we don't live in that perfection anymore. And that's because of sin. And here's where we diverge. We would explain to them that not following the will of the Almighty is what sin is. 
And because we sinned, we are under the curse, this curse of sin. And sin so invades our lives that we can't get rid of this curse upon us. Only the God who put the curse on us can get rid of it. But he loved us so much that he didn't want us to live eternally under that curse. So he sent his son Jesus to break the curse of sin and rescue us from eternal damnation. And, that, and God provides us this rescue from this curse of sin through holy baptism. In baptism, God washes us clean from our sin. The sign of the cross is placed upon us, marking us as one rescued by Jesus. And then God gives us his roho and tafatiku, his Holy Spirit that drives out the other spirits and protects us in Jesus' name. And that's the short version of it. But after telling that story, then the pastor and evangelist would ask the people if they want to be baptized in Jesus' name. There they received God's Spirit and the blessing of faith. On this trip, we baptized 1,263 people. Not quite the 3,000 of Pentecost, but it kind of gives you an idea that the number of 3,000 isn't just a made-up number, that it's quite possible to do that in one day. Also during this trip, we dedicated a church. We had worship services to set two cornerstones in two places that we were at two years ago in working in those villages of Monundi and Lubago. We also then bought two parcels of land uh, for churches to be built on in the next year or two. One of the parcels was about four and a half acres, and we paid uh, a million shillings for that, which in American dollars is $450. So about $100 an acre we spent to buy land for the church. But you can tell that the Christian church in Tanzania is experiencing a Pentecost. It's not about us, though, that produced the harvest. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit poured out on Pentecost, the same spirit that is still among us. You don't have to be a language professor. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to have special training to share the love of Jesus. Just ask Gary and Sandra and Cambry. All you have to do is be willing to share the story because the power of God's word not the person makes the difference. You can tell the story in its simplest form like we did and know that God is at work in it. That's our God. God whose will it is that all people come to faith and be saved. He has given us the privilege of growing his kingdom by sharing his story. It's our mission imperative to tell the story. The good news is what propels us forward. <clears throat> so my prayer is that the good news would so fill your heart to overflowing that you share the story with those people, those everyday people that God puts in your life. As we said a while back, don't just go to church, be the church. That's Pentecost. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.